Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's live hot topic video here on my Waves of Communication page. Today, I am talking about five communication blockages that stop kids from moving forward on a verbal communication track and kind of can actually keep families stuck in the moments of, you know, in, in on the path, I guess, towards nonverbal communication and increasing nonverbal. So what happens oftentimes is parents get, um, find themselves in a spot where their kids are, you know, not, they're realizing that they have a late talker on their hands and then they, um, you know, want to know what to do about their child and how to get them using words. And what happens is they make a decision about whether they want to go a nonverbal track, like using sign language or PEC systems or the prolocue, you know, the, the computer ones, or they decide they want to go on a verbal communication track. And the thing is, a lot of parents definitely want to go down that verbal communication track with their late talkers. They really want to teach them how to use words naturally, but something's blocking it. They're trying hard. Every parent I talk to tries super hard at this, but they have blockages. They have things that cause trouble. Like, you know, what is it that's going on? And there's five of them that happen and and a lot of times parents might give up their try because they think that their kids can't use verbal speech because of these blockages but in fact they are things that parents are overcoming every day in my waves of communication program so what i want to do on this hot topic video is explain to you what these five communication blockages are and give you some ideas about why they happen you know what ha what causes these things that get in the way of you teaching your child verbal speech so anyway, thank you for welcome welcome here again to this video today. Sorry, I'm just stumbling over my words. I am Marcy Melzer and I'm an intuitive speech and language pathologist. If this is the first time you're watching me, you um, can welcome to this video. Very welcome here. My mission is to help as many parents as possible teach their late talking children, no matter what's causing their late talking, how to use the words they need to share their wisdom with the world. I think kids have amazing things to talk, um, to tell us, and it's important for us as, um, as parents to work with our kids to get them going. And in fact, I know as a speech pathologist working in the field for 30 years that it is so important for parents to take on this job and teach your kids how to use the words they need. And so it's not, it's not a there's no strangers, there's no parents in my program who are strangers to this idea. In fact, all the parents who work with me come to me because they want to know how to teach their kids how to communicate because they've been trying. These parents have tried everything. I see Tracy's here. She's one of those moms in my program who has tried everything from diet to biomedical to all different kinds of therapies. And she has found that her um, her language facilitation at home has really helped her kiddo, but she had some of these communication blockages going on. So let me get down and talk about it. I was kind of waiting for a few more people to join. Thank you so much for being here. All right, so let's get in. These are the five communication blockages that sort of get in the way, like a block, um, to parents teaching kids. And the first one is, so parents try to teach things, they talk to their kids all the time, they read books, they try to do all of these things, but the first blockage is your child can't be bothered with what you're teaching. And I know that seems kind of crass or maybe a little superficial, but the reality is your child really might not care about the things that you are presenting to them, if especially if they're new. So many children who are late talkers spend a lot of their time in their heads thinking about 
what they how they have to communicate because if they they certainly have ideas right they're super smart kids they definitely want things they have ideas about stuff but they have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to communicate that stuff where those of us who have verbal speech just kind of spit out words and the ideas come out but late talkers we have to really do a lot of thinking and planning about that stuff and so because it takes a lot of energy to come up with new ideas late talkers often like to do the same things over and over again the things that they feel comfortable about the things that they have previously been successful communicating in one way or another so they stick to the things that they know and they like and feel more comfortable for them. And so any new exciting books or puzzles or even talking about the things that they're doing, they could be so engulfed in what they're doing and focusing all their energy and tension on the thing that's in front of them that they really can't be bothered with new things. In fact, it's almost irritating to them. So to put yourself in this position, and what I like to do when I explain these blockages is to sort of have parents put yourself in the position where you would be feeling like this and I can give you an example of this kind of situation so let's say you um, just learned how to play a video game and you're very excited about this video game but it takes a lot of concentration you're trying to figure your way through the maze you're trying to find the missing objects you're trying to whatever it is this game you're really focused on you want to beat your high score and you're working really hard on that and then someone brings in this new video game that they are very excited about and whatever and you're like dude i really like this like i i love my energy f focused on solving the problems or finding the riddles especially if you really get into it especially one that you're really good at so you're like look at me i'm like getting all the coins or finding all the treasures or doing all the things I'm really good at this when you're good at something you get positive feedback from it like well you get all the high scores or you beat your high score and all of that stuff you feel really good so late talkers are the same they get really excited about stuff and it might be stuff that they appear to be stimming on or they spend a lot of time with like running water or dumping things um, and they spend a lot of time they line up cars because they're examining each one or whatever they're into the trains the whatever it is they're so focused on it and they're getting a lot of positive feedback or you know feeling from this activity that's why they like to do it and here you come presenting something new and anything new to a late talker requires a whole level of learning where they've like oh now i've got to communicate about that thing i've got to learn about it i've got to see about what it is and all of that involves communication and communication is challenging for a late talker excuse me, they don't have words, so they have to use some other kind of behavior or picture system or whatever it is to try to communicate that stuff. And unless it's super easy to communicate with a facial expression or a yeah or no, they might not be inclined to even try. So that first blockage is literally your child can't be bothered with what you're doing. They're not interested in paying attention no matter how fun and exciting it is because they're already getting their jollies doing whatever they're doing, focusing their attention on what they love. And what you're doing isn't nearly as interesting as what they love, so they learn to tune it out because all that new stuff is, you know, takes effort for them to learn how to communicate about. So there's communication blockage number one. Your child can't be bothered with you trying your efforts. It's sad and it's and it's a and it's an unfortunate thing and it's a bummer, really, for parents to kind of realize that too. Like I try so hard, I get the latest toys online, I get all the stuff my speech therapist has, I get all this stuff. And when I present it at home, my child doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And that's because they're they're at home in their comfort zone doing the things that they love right so overcoming that communication blockage is easy because parents who do language facilitation focus on the things that your children love and follow their lead and that's the way that we structure through that communication blockage all right communication blockage number two is that your child your lay talker depending on the other kinds of language facilitation or communication facilitation that's going on in their life they may be tired of teaching 
um, because maybe they go to ABA for six hours a day. Maybe they go to speech therapy a number of times. And um, all of that time that they spend in ABA or speech therapy is focused on someone trying to pull words out of them or someone trying to get them to follow directions, do this, do what I say, focus on me. And in the case of ABA, they may have to do the same activity over and over and over again. Usually it's 10 times they have to show, at least they have to be presented with the, um, the task that they're expected to do 10 times so that the, the um, therapist can take data. And so they have to be presented with things over and over again. And so for a child who's in an ABA preschool or a school where there's lots of one-on-one -on -one time and they're expected to be working all that time during their day, at home they don't want to have it anymore. They're done. It's kind of like you. If you were going to work, sort of put yourself in this situation. And let's say you did a factory job where you had to do the same thing over and over and over again. And you got to switch every hour or so, but then you had to do that thing the same over and over again day in, day out, five days a week, when you came home, you aren't necessarily going to want to jump in and do some more learning, even though mom is a whole new fresh exposure thing, you know, that kind of stuff. And so what happens is they don't want to deal with you because they're wiped out. They're overstimulated. They're done with structured learning and you're trying to present them with more structured learning, even if it is a puzzle, a book, or whatever. And that's when kids sometimes will get silly. They, you know, throw things away or they run away from you when you bring something to them. It's not so much like the first thing that they can't be bothered, but in the second case, they're done. Like they're done with trying. And the same thing happens for kiddos whose parents shift into prompting at home. So if you at home are constantly prompting, prompting your child, keeping things out of reach, making them try to ask for it, um, you know, all the many of the strategies that speech therapists tell you to do involve that prompting. Like your child's not going to do it unless you make them do it. So all day long, you're making them do it. And after school, you're trying to make them do it too. They never shut off. Like they, the work never stops for them. So many late talkers just shut down when they get home because remember mom and dad are their safe zone. If they ever get hurt or you know, law at a loss for anything, they go to mom and dad. That's where they're going to get their fulfillment, that you're the ones that are always going to make them feel safe and happy. And they know that you are the source of that. And ultimately, you know that too. So it always breaks down at some point where parents prompt and prompt and prompt and prompt and prompt. And their kids might say words, but it's literally in the same way that a parent would sort of nag a child to take out the trash. Take out the trash. But they have to do it with every single piece of trash they do, they have to take it all the way to the curb, you know? So that's kind of what prompting is an equivalent to. And so all day long, is your child going to do it one time? Yeah, to make you happy or whatever, but all day long, nope, that's not quite good enough. Just pointing to the thing or giving me a noise or whatever isn't quite good enough. No, you have to say a word too. The child's going to be like, mm -mm, I'm done. I'm out. I don't want it that bad. It's not that much work for me right? They don't want the pressure of the prompt and it can shut down a, lang a well-intending language facilitation parent every single time, every single time. All right, so that's tip number two. They are um, blockage number two. They don't want the pressure. Okay, blockage number three is a fear, okay? So this blockage is fear, and it is a fear of being judged by others. So think about a late talker, especially one who is older than three or four or five, a nonverbal child who's using other things to communicate, all kinds of noises or behaviors or whatever. You know, I mean, it's a very common thing I hear from moms of late talking kids. Everywhere you go, you're having to justify your child's behavior to um, not so well-meaning other people. 
Um, sometimes kids can be pretty judgmental. How come you don't talk? Maybe parents are, oh, he's big. Why, you know, doesn't he say things? Or, you know, they, they throw diagnoses at you and call things. Lay talkers are not unintelligent to this situation. They are very, very aware that they don't communicate as well as other people. In fact, most late talkers understand at least the idea of what's going on, especially when they get over the over four years old. They understand everything that's going on. They know they're being judged by everyone. And when parents try again with the all the things you're trying to get your child to do and they are not, you know, inclined to try with it because they're they know they're not good at it. And when they try it, it might not be as clear if they're talking is, you know, an intelligibility problem, it might not be as clear as other kids and other people have difficulty understanding them when they talk because they use echolalic speech and you might understand that, you know, put it in means a lot of different things at your house or this one or no another one or, you know, those little phrases that kids learn to sort of help them communicate with you at home. Those things don't work other places. And so at birthday parties or the park or out at restaurants or whatever, if your kid, especially if they have a lot of emotions, they're tired, they have a lot, they want to wait, they're very excited, they see somebody they haven't seen for a while, or they're a little intimidated by the situation, you might get some pretty um, big behavior to go with those big feelings, and you might get some big reactions from other people. And kids see it, they totally know and they understand. And it definitely is a blockage that causes parents and causes kids to stay more nonverbal. They just avoid trying at all because of the fear of other people. Now, the parents in my waves of communication are overcoming this blockage by getting the strategies they need to help their child be safe communicating with them in their household where there's not going to be any pressure or um, or pulling words or extra work or things like that because we make everything fun and easy. But we also really work with, I work with moms on the kinds of strategies you need to communicate to your parents if they don't understand that stuff. Um, or even if they speak a different language, if there's a different culture involved, if you move to a new place and they, you have have to go to new schools, preschools, babysitters, daycare stuff, um, how to communicate with your friends about your child and empower them, your child and yourself to own the late talking process and the language facilitation process. And because they see progress so quickly, in working in these functional situations, the parents um, don't have these issues anymore. Their kids aren't afraid to try talking because they totally have fun with it every single day. So that is number three. The third blockage that lay talkers often have is that children are afraid of judgment by other people because of their, um, their less ability ability to communicate when they first especially when they start to use words that they're just not as good at it as other people and they're aware of it and they don't want to be judged so that's why they avoid it right that's why they avoid it and they're like oh nonverbal system much easier for me I'll go with the pecs I'll go with the stuff because they avoid it but it doesn't help them overcome it right avoiding is not the same as overcoming these communication blockages and parents can do it parents are doing it all over all over the world um, all right so number four is that a late talker may be there, a communication blockage is that the late talker is anxious that their tries are not sufficient and good enough for you. So it kind of goes back to that avoiding pressure thing, but what happens is it really is a big bash to their self-confidence. Right. So there's the fear of being judged by other people, but even in their own home, they have this massive anxiety about not being good enough because previously your whole life, the late talker has been communicating with you using facial expression and feelings. It's just how you know what your child is thinking without 
even them saying anything, just with a look, just with a kind of a time of day or a, an expression they have, you can know what they're thinking, especially if you look around in the circumstance. As they get older, it gets more challenging. But the kids don't understand that you still aren't able to read their mind. Like when they're babies, it's easy to guess and anticipate what they want, right? How many things can it be? They're wet, they need food, they, they're cold, you know, something startled them, you know, whatever. You just, it's easy to keep a tiny baby safe and warm and cuddly and fun. You can hold them in your arms and keep them warm, right? But as kids get older, their needs become way more complex. And here's the thing, late talkers don't understand why at two and three years old, you can't still read their mind when they're thinking about Peppa Pig. They don't understand that you don't know all of the things that they want because their whole lives you have, right? As parents, you have known what they want. And they expect that to be able to continue. They expect you to be able to read their mind, especially if you are doing a lot of guessing in your household. So if it's just sort of that time of day and food sort of arrives for your child without them even letting you know they're hungry, they quickly learn to expect that kind of um, situation to continue. Why should they expect any kind of change? Why should they start to have to ask for food if, it just arrives most of the time. Eventually when I'm hungry, oh, I'll just make a noise and food will arrive. And if you're guessing what your child wants based on their behavior without facilitating language, number one, you're missing all that opportunity because your child is communicating to you. <clears throat> but you're not even showing them what the words are for those things, the right words the right way at the right time. So kids get, um, kids get self-conscious about, you know, what do you mean you're asking me to do this more? And suddenly it changes, like you don't read my mind and you can't figure it out. So the strategies we use with parents who are constantly guessing and anticipating their kids' needs is number one, you have to stop that, right? But then you have to learn how to facilitate the language for exactly where your child is on their developmental spectrum. That's why the Waves of Communication program is different for every family because every family is at a different stage. In fact, I have some families that have multiples, twins or triplets, and their kids, each one of them, are communicating at different stages. And so parents need strategies to use with each child. If you've got a five-year-old late talker and a two-year-old who's just starting to use language, you're going to need different strategies to work with each one of those kids because they're at different levels of talking. Maybe your five-year-old is late talking, but already using single words and maybe some echolalic speech, but your two-year-old is still using um, noises and meltdowns and things like that. You know, each one, each child communicates differently, but you are only one parent. So you need to get the strategies to work with each one of your kiddos at their individual specific communication level. Because here's the thing, if you try things that are too hard, like too many steps ahead, like you, you said cookie one time, so now you have to say cookie all the time. And you said you did this once, so now I know you can, or I saw you do it in therapy, so now I know you can, so now I always expect you to do it at home. And when you lay those kinds of heavy expectations on kids who have their whole life been communicating with you telepathically, you know, you've understood what they want, and now all of a sudden you're making them do stuff, that makes them feel not good enough. Like, what happened? And think about how you would feel if you were going to your work and it was working successfully and you were going to work eight hours a day and you were getting paid $10 an hour or $20 an hour or whatever you get. And then suddenly the boss called you in the office and said, now things are going to change. We're going to do things differently now where you have to work an additional eight hours and we're not going to pay you anymore. You just have to wait even longer to get your paycheck. That's what you're doing by shifting quickly into from, from that, um, okay, anticipating your child's needs to, oh, you got to say it before you get it. 
When you shift that quickly like that, kids will check out every single time. They will put up the uh-uh that seriously is I don't want it. And it's because they feel like they're not good enough, okay, to get this thing anymore. So it's really important. That's a really, really important one to overcome. If you're experiencing those feelings with your child, like they literally like you ask them to do something and they roll your eyes and go away, think about how you would feel if the boss asked you to work twice as long for just as much money and wait to get the paycheck because that's what you're doing by expecting your child to prompt. If you are doing this and you are in that household, you need the strategies to help you work out of that situation, okay? Um, all right, and then this, the fifth one, the last blockage, communication blockage that happens very often with late talkers and parents definitely can't overcome is that kids are frustrated because they feel like the expectation is something that they can't do. It's so hard, they think it's like climbing Mount Everest. Um, even though, like you said, they have done it before. They literally feel incapable. Like, I can't raise my arm, it won't go any higher. Like, even though they know it can and the muscles all work, like, they just feel like it can't get there. And that's where a lot of, kids are actually misdiagnosed with apraxia because they don't even try because they think it's too hard. Like they think that it's just too out of their reach and they don't understand how to do it because what probably happened was in therapy um, or wherever they were, whenever it happened, it sort of popped out spontaneously the first time. And it, it might have even surprised the child. That's usually what happens when you do language facilitation and the words kind of pop out on their own. And they're like, whoa, he said duck. He was playing with the duck. That happened with one of the moms. They just were two days into language facilitation, doing some great work. And they were doing this thing and they were playing with the ducks in the bathtub. And their child said duck. And it popped out and it surprised all of them. It surprised everybody and they were like oh my goodness two days in he's already saying a word and then he didn't say it again right it popped out because what happened was <laughs> they jumped on it and they said oh no he's already starting to talk and then they started they shifted back and started to get back into okay we're gonna say duck all the time because now ducks in his vocabulary and he can say duck but he doesn't but he didn't do it and it happened it wasn't intentional the first time he didn't say this is a duck I'm gonna say duck duck it popped out naturally, like natural language talking, like you hear me stumbling on my words just because they're kind of tumbling out of my mouth. That's natural language. And when it first emerges, it's not always right, it's not always accurate, it's not always on time, but it always is a surprise when it first starts. And everybody gets so excited about it, but it's not, that doesn't mean that it's learned. So it's kind of like riding a bicycle. The first time you get on it and you let go and you go down the street and your parents let go for the first time and you wobble, for, you know, two or three, four before you stop. And you don't fall down this time and you get some really nice success. Are you ready to like blaze off and ride across the country? No, you need a lot more support to help you understand that riding a bicycle is really super easy, right? So what happens is you see a skill in therapy or the therapist said, he said X, Y, and Z now, or he can use the I want phrase, or he can do whatever, and you go home and you try to get it going and it's not working. And then you think, oh, no, he's lost it, whatever. And then what happens to so many parents is you freak out thinking, oh, no, it's not working. But you don't understand how language development is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens sort of like a snowball. You start to get some ideas about, oh, you know, this word means cup. This word means drink. This word means mama. This word means all of these kinds of things, right? So when kids start to figure out how language works, then they have to practice it. They have to try it out a bunch of times, how it goes. And so what ends up happening so many times, because remember kids who are late talking are already late. They're already two or three or four or 10 or however old. And parents, it, it happens to all of you, and this is what causes this blockage, actually. It's your expectation. It's your parental expectation of my child should be able to. And 
and testing it and trying it and prompting it and pulling it all day long. When your child isn't in the same boat, he doesn't feel equally as capable as you and his therapists do. It comes from all those other things, all those other blockages, the anxiety. It doesn't only happen one of these. Some kids have all of these. So if you're trying really hard with your kiddo, I mean, the harder you try, you literally could be energetically pushing them away from you. Because all of these blockages, they're like, dude, I, 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 I can't be bothered. I'm too busy doing what I'm doing. I like this. This is where I get my jollies in my space. Because otherwise, people are prompting me, prodding me, pulling words all day long. It, you know, all, so many parents I talk to who call me for strategy sessions say, I can't believe how much work this is. All I do is prompt and pull and do it. And I know he can do it. And sometimes he will. But then they they keep doing it because maybe they did sometimes and then it tanks the kids success with that prompting forgets because they figure you out they're like oh well eventually they'll give me the food or eventually they'll do it or maybe if i just go back to the meltdowns they'll cave and give in because you're the mom you want your kiddo to be happy you want them to be safe you want them to have fun you want them whatever and that's actually another really common trait when I talk to these parents, yeah, there's these blockages, but otherwise their kiddos are happy. You as parents work hard to make them happy. You make them feel safe, you let them have fun and whatever. And they in themselves are able to generate that fun more easily than they are from you because with you, the fun comes with work. It comes with pressure, it comes with anxiety, it comes with feeling of inadequacy. So if you're asking your child questions all day, it's another real common prompting that parents do to pull language out of their kids. What are you doing? What is that? Do you want this? You know, even as you're handing them something, do you want this? Of course they want it, it's ice cream, you know what I mean? There's other things you can do to facilitate natural language and avoid all of this prompting. So that's why when I say there are these five blockages, they're very, very common. And the thing is when you overcome these blockages and you show your child how super fun language learning can be from you, then, and that's what Tracy, the gal who I was talking about at the beginning of this video, that's what she figured out. Once she got her kiddo, paying attention to her talking and responding and trying to use words and really engaged with her using natural language facilitation, now she's finding herself able to pull out those puzzles, able to color, able to read books together, able to sing and dance and enjoy time together because she's not energetically pushing her kiddo away anymore. By her expectation of he's got to do more, I've got to try more, I've got to get more because he's late talking and, and the older he gets the later it gets and that energy that you feel that expectation that you know my kids got to talk your kiddos pick up on it absolutely just like when you're happy they're happy when you're sad they're sad sometimes you can stub your toe and be frustrated and cursing around the house and your kiddos will come and pat you and know they know you're upset they completely communicate and they jive with you and so the thing is when the you have these blockages it can be really disempowering for parents right it can be super super frustrating because your your best interests are for your child you're not doing this to torture them you're not doing them to to intentionally make them anxious and fearful and frustrated and nonchalant and push them away you're not intentionally you love them and of course the times that you quit the pressure they come they hug you they cuddle you they share their love and so do you and what i I'm here to tell you today is that when you overcome these blockages, all the natural language that you want to facilitate is right here in front of you and able to do. Because you're not pushing your child any way, way anymore because when you do natural language facilitation, the other thing happens, your kids start to follow you. Because they love that energy. They love the easy, happy, safe, and fun energy and they seek it out and they want to get engaged with their parents and they want to learn from them. And it doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home mom or if you work two jobs and you see your child for an hour and a half in the morning and two hours in the evening. 
you can still do language facilitation. And in my program, you can teach whoever is with your child how to do that language facilitation and work with you. Even kids who have um, two parents who aren't together anymore and they live in separate places. I've got one where both parents are doing amazing language facilitation and their kiddos making super progress. And I've got another situation in my program where the parent B isn't on board at all. But the child learns so much communication and verbal language from parent number one that the child is actually teaching parent number two how to do that and get whatever. And parent number two is getting on board. This little girl is now verbal who was using nothing but gestures and meltdowns. And it happened quickly for her. So it can happen for you too. That's the thing, the most important thing that I want to tell you about this message. All the tips, all the tricks, all the language facilitation, all the book reading, the storytelling, the songs, all of that stuff, none of it is going to be effective with your late talker unless you overcome the blockages. So I hope this video was helpful for you. I see some people said thanks for um, joining me and saying good points. I really appreciate you watching. If you're catching this on the vid on the replay, welcome again. If um, I do these hot topic videos every single week on my Waves of Communication page, and they also get over to my YouTube channel. So if you want to see all of the videos together, a great place is over at the YouTube channel. They're all organized into playlists so you can see everything. So you can learn the tips and tricks once you overcome these communication blockages. And of course, if you are interested in joining the Waves of Communication community, it's a community parent coaching program. Parents help each other. I help the parents and everyone in my program who puts in the work every day and takes the suggestions I give them, every single parent, no matter what is causing their child's late talking, everything from vaccine injury, hearing issues from ear tubes, um, ASD diagnoses, brain malformation, everything that causes late talking <clears throat> can result in these blockages that I talked about. So. If you need help overcoming these communication blockages so you can get down to business and help your child learn to use the words they need, that's when you need to reach out to me and you can do that at my website, wavesofcommunication.com. There's a free class for parents there and there is also um, all kinds of information including all the program options, the pricing, everything is out there so you can investigate everything. And if you are ready to get started and you want to know how to overcome these communication blockages with your family fast, these blockages you can overcome super fast. Just by changing some of the habits and strategies that you're using at home for language facilitation and training the other people who, who are hanging out with your kids how to use those strategies too. All the strategies we use are meant to be done during your everyday activities. They don't require extra materials at all. Just everything that you have, you do, and you see every day, all day. Just like parents teach kids everything, all during the activities that you do every day while you have fun. All right. Thanks again for joining me, everybody. Now you know how to reach out to me to find out. Please give this video a like. If you're watching me on YouTube, please subscribe to my channel. I'm really trying to build my subscribers so that I can help everybody out. It doesn't cost you anything, and it really helps me a lot. So just hit the subscribe button. And if you want to make sure you see all the videos that I upload, that little bell thing is where you get all the notifications. And you'll see every time I upload a video, at least two or three a week. So everybody, thanks so much for joining me today. And I will see you all on my next live video. Have a great day.